tonight's speakers. Dr. Richard Haas is the president of the Council of Foreign Relations. An experienced diplomat and policymaker, he served as the senior Middle East advisor to President George H.W. Bush, as director of the policy planning staff under Secretary of State Colin Powell, and as the U.S. envoy to both the Cyprus and Northern Ireland peace talks. A recipient of the Presidential Citizens Medal, the State Department's Distinguished Honor Award, and the Tipperary International Peace Award. He is also the author or editor of 14 other books, including the best-selling A World in Disarray. Joining Dr. Haas in tonight's conversation will be Dr. Matthew Akers, Associate Director of Bliss Institute of Applied Politics at the University of Akron. Now, please join me in providing a warm virtual welcome for both Dr. Akers and Dr. Haas. Thank you so much for both your time this evening. Take it away. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Uh, Dr. Haas, I also want to thank you for being with us this evening. It's a privilege to talk with you and to hear your thoughts on global literacy or how the world works uh, based on your extensive experience and expertise in foreign policy and world affairs. Now, this evening, we are discussing your recent book, The World, A Brief Introduction, which former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright described as a book that explains how the world really works, how it is changing, and why it matters. And I was extremely impressed. You did that in about 350 pages. So <laughs> that, that's a feat in and of itself. Um, I'd like to begin the discussion with you tonight, though, by asking you if you would um, share with us, well, why did you decide to write the book? What, what was going through your mind when you, when you came up with this idea? Well, thank you, Matt, uh, for your doing this. Uh, thank you, uh, others uh, associated uh, with, with, with Hudson. Uh, I have some ties to Ohio as a graduate of Oberlin College, so it's great to be back at least virtually, if not, uh, if not physically. Uh, I'm sorry, actually, I had to write this book, or I felt the need to write this book. And uh, ideally, in the world, it would not have been necessary that people would have known the fundamentals about the world and how it works and why it matters and why what the United States does or doesn't do in the world, why, why all that matters. They would have known that from school, whether it was high school or college, university. They would have known it from watching television, from uh, the Internet, from conversations over the dinner table and the like. But unfortunately, uh, they don't. And lots of reasons why. But in many cases, uh, it's not taught. There's a crowding out phenomena, at lots of levels of schooling, or, or in those areas at, at higher education where it is offered, it's not required. And you can graduate from virtually any institution in the United States, elite and otherwise. And if you navigate your course requirements uh, in a way that is, uh, makes you comfortable, you can graduate knowing very little about the world that you will enter and that will shape your life. For that matter, you'll, you can also ent uh, leave the campus to know very little about American democracy what in my generation we called civics or, or, or social uh, studies. Uh, most television, quote unquote, news doesn't give you uh, much of it, certainly doesn't give you the background, the, the explanation, the, uh, the history. And the internet, you can find just about everything you want. That's the good news. The bad news, bad news though, is you can find just about everything you want. And I don't know about your computer map, but mine doesn't come with yellow post-it notes saying, believe this, uh, question or ignore that. So I just essentially you know, came to the conclusion and there was one graphic conversation one day. I met this young man who was going into his senior year at Stanford, about to major, major in, in computer sciences. And when I asked him questions about what he was studying and what else he was studying, after a few minutes, it became painfully apparent that this bright young man going to one of the great universities in the world was going to be functionally illiterate about uh, the world he was going to enter and that was gonna shape his life for better and for worse. Uh, and that's what got me to do it. And what also got me to do it was a real concern that if people didn't understand the world, didn't care about the world, uh, they wouldn't hold politicians accountable. When they voted, these issues wouldn't be high in their consciousness. They would not be what Thomas Jefferson called uh, informed citizens. And I also thought that if Americans didn't know about the world and understand why it matters, they would be far more susceptible to being isolationist. That if you didn't think it would somehow affect your life and you could just safely ignore it, well, people will, will, will ignore it. Unfortunately, you will not ignore it safely. What we've learned with uh, 
you know, this virus uh, with COVID-19 uh, that we're living with, but also dying from in enormous numbers, whether it was terrorism 20 years ago with um, 9-11, whether it's with climate change day in, day out, whether it's with the access, the hacking and the disrupting of our cyber systems, that like it or not, the world matters in, in all sorts of ways. And we have got to understand it. We've got to be prepared for it. We've got to, we need as, as a country an active debate about our role in it. So I, I want to uh, follow up on that question, but I think that I may have forgotten to mention for the audience out there, please feel free to put your question and answers in the question and answer. Um, should be a little icon on your screen and uh, you, can, you can type those in and we will have time to take uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, but Dr. Haas, you, you mentioned um, isolationism, and one of the things that, that I noted in your book, um, you talk, I, I think it's almost a thread going through the entire book, you talk about populism, protectionism, and nationalism. And to me, those are, are three forces that have been um, maybe on the rise, especially in the West, in America, in Europe, and, and in other areas. And uh, as you alluded to, I think with the isolationism, you uh, believe that those can harm the global order. So um, I know that's maybe a long question, but would you talk just a little bit about maybe those three forces, if you do see those, if, you, if, if I'm correct and you see those as threats, but that populism, protectionism, and nationalism. So my problem with the isms. <laughs> <laughs> populism I have problems with. Uh, and we've seen it in this country. I think Donald Trump was uh, in many ways a populist leader. We see it in Brazil with, with uh, Bolsonaro. We see it in Mexico with Lopez Obrador. We see it in uh, India with Modi. We see it in many places, Turkey. Populist leaders uh, give short shrift to institutions. Uh, political opposition often gets, uh, doesn't get a, a legitimate say. Uh, rule of law often gets uh, bypassed. And it can be very appealing to a country. It can rouse all sorts of emotions. But a lot of the checks and balances that protect democracies, that ensure that minorities are protected, uh, and the rest often get overwhelmed. So populism, to me, tends to be dangerous. Uh, and we have the, the rule of law and checks and balances for good reasons. The founders were very worried about the rise of uh, populism. Uh, nationalism can be healthy or unhealthy. It all depends uh, upon uh, the dosage, almost like medicine. A little bit of nationalism is great. Countries need it. Uh, it's what brings you together, a sense of common identity. And in many cases, if you look at the rise of countries, their history, often it resulted from this common identity, nationalism, uh, particularly after World War II, when all sorts of colonies became uh, independent countries. We ourselves went through that experience 250 years ago. The problem with nationalism is when it gets uh, hyper on steroids, and then often it becomes uh, incredibly intolerant of others. And it's a very zero-sum approach nationally and internationally between those who aren't seen as part of the, the national fabric of the country or other countries themselves. And hyper-nationalism, as we've seen throughout history, obviously in the middle of the 20th century, can be incredibly uh, uh, dangerous. And more recently, we've seen it, say, with Russian nationalism. And the price, say, that Ukraine has uh, uh, paid. Uh, lastly, you mentioned uh, protectionism, essentially opposition to uh, open trade. And my own view is that, by and large, on balance, trade is a, a force for good. It's a great creator of wealth. It's, uh, many jobs are, are tied to it. Also, it creates uh, linkages between and among countries, which can be a bulwark against their acting uh, recklessly or, or violently. Now, when you have trade, uh, at times certain jobs will disappear, sometimes because of foreign competition, more often though because of uh, new, new technologies, innovation that increase uh, productivity. And what happens with protection though is it's quite indiscriminate. And we uh, block imports, uh, and, and often it's related to mercantilism or we advantage exports. And the problem is if everybody does it, trade breaks down. And imports can be a source of innovation. They can be a source of uh, cheaper uh, items. Exports are obviously a source of, uh, 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 of jobs. So trade historically 
has been a real force for economic growth and development. If you look at the post-World War II world and you look at the increase in living standards in this country and around the world, it has been phenomenal. There, it's unprecedented. And one of the principal, re principal reasons that wealth was created and living standards increased as much as they have here and around the world is because of trade. And what we've also known, I understand that there are those factories and jobs that have been hurt by trade, sometimes by unfair trade practices. And we've got their policies to respond to unfair trade practices, sanctions or tariffs. And in many cases, we have to really help workers. Uh, you know, my generation was somewhat different, but I think anyone who's in his, his, his or her 20s listening to this, Matt, in the course of their career, they'll go through, what, 15, maybe 20 jobs. And some of the jobs they start with in 20 years won't even exist anymore uh, because of new technologies that, that come around. So what we've got to build into this society is two things. One is uh, the ability to constantly get reskilled, retooled, re-educated, retrained to take advantage uh, so you're ready for these new jobs. And second of all, we need a cushion or a safety net, to use the technical phrase, so we can move around jobs easily. One thing this would mean, for example, is that healthcare might not be always tied to your job. Uh, retirement might be in many ways something you would bring with you, what's called portability with IRAs and the like. I believe we need to build a society where people in the course of their lives can change jobs for whatever reasons uh, multiple times and not pay a price uh, for it. And we're simply not there yet. So you, you almost see technology as being equally disruptive um, as, as some of these trade issues where- Oh, much more actually. The, there's a lot of research that would guess, that would estimate, oh, say over the last decade or two, probably 80 to 90% of the jobs that have disappeared in the United States have been because of technology, because of productivity enhancements, not because of foreign competition, not because of offshore, offshoring, not because of unfair trade practices, and then again, the problem is so much of our, our, our politics don't seem to recognize that. So many of our, our responses seem to target trade rather than boost the ability of workers to cope with the fact that some jobs will disappear inevitably, but then new ones will come on stream. And right now, by the way, coming out of COVID, I think that could get worse. What we're going to see is a lot of businesses that went out of business. Now, uh, obviously, we're going to see new businesses start up. In many cases, they're going to start up with newer technologies. In some cases, they may want to become less dependent on workers because they're worried about some future pandemic. But we've already got millions and mid millions of jobs that are unfilled. Now, obviously, we have to make those jobs attractive with wages that support a, a viable uh, lifestyle. We've got to provide, again, what I call the safety net. But we've also, got, we've also got to figure out a way to get workers, as they go through their life, the, the skills that they need to, to access these jobs that are emerging. Let me stay on uh, this, this theme um, for one more question here, kind of, a, again, going back to the isms, if you will, of, of uh, a little bit of nationalism here. But um, in, in part two of the book, you give a great overview of regions of the world. And I believe, if I remember correctly, you start with Europe and you discuss the unification of Europe after World War II. Uh, you talk about the European community and eventually the European Union. Um, but then you also discuss the weakening of that unification um, through events like Brexit. So, um, you know, one of the phrases that, that struck me in, in that section of the book, you talked about that there is a difference between the United States of Europe and a united Europe of states. And so I'm just wondering, um, you know, I think many of us have, have know a little bit about Brexit, but how does that concept maybe play into, again, these, these forces that we're seeing, um, uh, you know, in the West and in Europe? Okay, it's a thoughtful question. Look, after World War II, one of the goals shared by some, some of the wise at that time, men of Europe, was to so knit together the economies of Europe and above all France and Germany, so that war between them would become unthinkable, that they would be so interdependent that neither would have a, a serious option of going to war because war had twice plagued Europe in the 20th century in ruinous ways. 
And it began with a coal and steel community of six countries, ultimately became the European community, more recently became the European Union, much larger, much more uh, uh, integrated. And there's been different visions of Europe, and it's all about the relationship of the, the power balance between national capitals and Brussels, the, the collective of Europe. So the phrase, the United States of Europe, like the United States of America, represents a very integrated Europe where Brussels uh, holds an awful lot of authority and individual member countries in many ways cede some of their normal sovereign rights to, to this supranational Brussels-led authority. The alternative was the United Europe of States, essentially some togetherness, but a greater degree of uh, independence or autonomy. And that was the great debate for a while. With Brexit, we see obviously not even a united Europe of states, we see a disunited Europe of states where the Brits went their uh, own way. We see both tendencies coexisting, kind of push and pull. Uh, at the beginning of COVID, interestingly enough, at the beginning of the pandemic, Europe seemed to be coming together. European economic finance authorities were acting collectively for the greater good. And then more recently, Europe has really hurt itself by not making adequate preparations for the production and dissemination of uh, vaccines. And uh, there's a lot of disillusionment with, uh, with Europe. So uh, again, this, the, the creation of modern Europe was, I believe, one of the great accomplishments of uh, the post-World War II era. It, for some, it's gone too far. For some, it hasn't gone far enough. I don't, I don't have a crystal ball. But uh, I think this tension will continue to exist between national governments, uh, the collective Europe, and like the Brits going your own way. And I think to some extent, we'll see what happens with Britain, depending upon the success of, uh, to use the formal title, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I think other countries will be looking at how, that, how, 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 that, how the UK fares. And if the UK unravels or doesn't do well economically, it will obviously... Uh, dampen the appetites of others to uh, do their own version of, uh, of, of exiting from the, uh, from the collective Europe. Okay, well, um, let me ask you now a little bit about, um, the, in that uh, outline of, of history and the various regions that you go through in the book, um, you see us as residing, as, as a number of scholars do, in the post-Cold War period. Um, what do you see now are the largest challenges we face in this current period, and which countries are the chief players? Uh, let me put them in three baskets. One challenge is a very familiar one, and it is a uh, great power rivalry. In particular, in this case, between the United States and China, we being the great power of the era, China being the, the rising power. And then also Russia, which is still a great power in certain ways. It's got one of the two largest nuclear arsenals in the world. It obviously is a great power in energy. It's a great power with conventional military force, great power with, with, with cyber, even though it's got a relatively small economy and a relatively small population. But working out relations between and among the great powers, that's, that's what it's a, a lot of history is about. And when that breaks down, it gets pretty ugly, as we saw in the 20th century. Uh, what was, by the way, special about the second half of the 20th century, <coughs> excuse me, is the Cold War state cold. Mm -hmm. And the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union did not get out of, out of hand, which obviously would have been beyond ruinous given the presence of nuclear weapons. But that's one challenge. Is how do we deal? How do we manage U.S.-Russian and U.S.-Chinese rivalry so it doesn't spill over into conflict? And it doesn't preclude, for example, areas of limited cooperation where we need cooperation, which brings me to the second basket or bucket, which is global issues. We're living in an era where globalization is a reality. And we're, as a, whether it's infectious disease, we talked about trade, the movement of goods and services, cyberspace, uh, uh, we, whether one's talking about climate change, the spread of uh, nuclear materials, uh, other weapons, um, terrorists. Uh, what all these things have in common is that borders don't count for much. And the problem is that in virtually every one of these instances, and whether the things that are moving around are benign or malign, 
the international arrangements in place to, to regulate them, to manage these flows are inadequate. And the countries of the world simply haven't been willing or able to agree to come together with arrangements for, for dealing with these challenges. And hence, we're dealing with the pandemic. Hence, uh, climate change is, is, is outpacing uh, collective responses to it and, and so forth. And then thirdly, and this is not something that I would have a few years ago, maybe five or 10 years ago, put on this list if you, asked, if you would ask me that question. The third big issue is us. Uh, the United States for the last three quarters of a century, for 75 years, we have played a, an outsized role in the world. We have been, if you will, uh, I guess things are going good. I'll use a real estate metaphor. Um, the United States has been both the, the principal architect and the general contractor of what's going on in the world. Now, we've had all sorts of subcontractors and partners. We haven't done it unilaterally, but we've taken the lead. And what's happened over the last you know, towards the end of the Obama administration, certainly it characterized the Trump administration. And now we see divisions in Washington. There's a growing number of Americans who don't want to do that anymore, who basically think it's, it's not worth it, that, uh, that they look at things like the Iraq war, Afghanistan, and they say, all this international involvement has been terrible, or they look at all of our domestic challenges and say, we've got to fix things here on the home front. We don't have the luxury of focusing on the world. The problem is, Again, the world matters. And even if we don't want to focus on it, it's not done with us. And lots of things can emanate from overseas and come here that could uh, hurt us. So I think to understand the challenges out there and why this is such an, an interesting but also demanding period of history is you've got these three different baskets of great power rivalry, if you will, the, to the traditional stuff of history. You've got this whole set of global challenges which in many ways is, is new to the world. And then thirdly, you have American doubts and divisions about what it is we, we are prepared to, to do in the world. Dr. Ross, um, and, and I'll just remind the audience again, we're getting very close to getting to the audience question and answer period. So please questions are coming in, but please uh, feel free in the question and answer function just to submit your questions. Um, one of the things I wanted to follow up on, uh, I was very intrigued by uh, your explanation of why the, the Cold War stayed cold um, in the book. Uh, could you talk just a little bit about that? Because I think, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't a given that it would stay cold, right? Um, and so uh, what, what contributed to that? I'd almost begin the answer with some playing off some words you use, Matt. There are no givens in history. One of the things that we've got to be really careful about are assumptions about what's inevitable. Like I've been lucky, I've, I've worked for four presidents. I've worked for President Carter, President Reagan, and both Presidents Bush. And one of my principal takeaways is almost nothing is baked into the cake. What presidents and their senior staff do and decide and, and the like uh, shapes history. And different people in those positions would produce very different policies. Uh, so it wasn't inevitable that the Cold War would stay cold. It wasn't inevitable that it would end when it did, that it would end peacefully and on terms overwhelmingly in our favor. We saw the dissolution of the Soviet Union, which was a, an empire in and of itself. We saw the dissolution of the Soviet's external empire in Eastern Europe, the Warsaw Pact. This, for the most part, happened peacefully. This is extraordinary. Uh, so much of history, if you think about what happened around the time of World War I, and you looked at the, the great empires in the world, when they unraveled, you had met bloody revolutions and wars. And it, it did. So it, things turned out, you know, at the end, extraordinarily well. But you asked me, why did the, the Cold War stay cold? I think in large part, it was nuclear weapons, that you had large arsenals on the two sides that were configured in ways that introduced a great degree of caution into US and Soviet calculations that as they went about pursuing their interest and dealing with their differences, each side acted with a degree of caution because it was impossible to argue that any outcome would have been worth annihilation and nuclear war would have led to mutual annihilation. That was the whole logic or genius of what was called mad, mutual assured destruction then it didn't matter if you struck first, you would still be vulnerable to retaliation. That introduced a great degree of 
caution into areas of difference, such as in, um, in Europe, in Asia, Middle East, and elsewhere. So there were rules largely unwritten, tacit, sometimes communicated, sometimes not, about the limits to what either would do directly, in particular, indirectly, on behalf of friends and allies. So I think it was an extraordinary period, four decades of quite remarkable statecraft. The most dramatic moment was probably the Cuban Missile Crisis in those 13 days in uh, October of uh, 62. But there were many other dramatic moments, Middle East wars, even in Vietnam and so forth, where there were certain rules of the road, I guess I would say, that grew up between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, that each accepted limits on what it would do to promote their interests including the United States accepted limits on what it would do inside the Soviet Union. Early on in the Cold War, and I, and I say this for a reason, there were those who called for quote unquote rollback to somehow destroy the communist hold on, on the Soviet Union. And that idea was ultimately jettisoned as too risky and, uh, and, and dangerous and that we had to learn to live with that Soviet Union. And again, focus most of our foreign policy on their foreign policy rather than trying to change their internal nature. In the end, we got fortunate, we did both. We, after 40 years, we limited their reach externally and then conditions came about within the Soviet Union, largely I think because of their own economic and political failings. And then the arrival on the scene of Mikhail Gorbachev uh, that, led to, that led to the end of the Soviet Union. But again, none of that was preordained and I think there was leadership on both sides that acted with uh, restraint. And I do believe that nuclear weapons introduced a surprising degree of stability. Or to put it another way, I think you'd be hard pressed to make the case that we would have avoided World War III if nuclear weapons hadn't been fielded in the way they were fielded, two large, robust arsenals mm -hmm. on the two sides that made the idea of striking first or acting recklessly uh, prohibitively costly. So it's, um, it was a, a special period of history, I think, because of uh, some very special circumstances. So, Dr. Haas, in the book, you also mentioned that I believe there are nine known countries with nuclear weapons at this point. So, you know, just following up on that, do you believe that that is also providing a balance of power right now? I mean, I think that a lot of people hear those numbers and, and they're very concerned, especially with some of the countries that may be among those nine that we know of. Um, but um, do they provide a, a similar balance of power that you may be talking about? Well, I believe that U.S. Russian deterrence still exists. There's a degree of it with U.S., uh, China, France, and Britain. Nuclear weapons have been irrelevant to our relationships. Uh, it probably, though, gives Russia something to, to think about. I don't feel good at all about the Indo Indian and Pakistani nuclear establishments, in part because I'm not sure either is persuaded that going first would be a ruinous mistake. Again, it's not nuclear weapons per se that introduce stability. It's the notion that striking first is not an advantage. And I'm not sure we have those kinds of arsenals there. Plus, there's also questions in places like Pakistan, given terrorism and radicalism, of what's called the command and control of these weapons, whether they could fall into, quote unquote, the, the wrong hand. So the idea that the spread of nuclear weapons to those countries is, uh, to more countries is desirable, which some some have advocated. Uh, I do not believe that. North Korea uh, has them. And again, I, I worry that it could give it the uh, two things. One, they could be, you know, they have involved them in exporting certain nuclear materials to others, which is worrisome. And it might give them a sense that they could act with impunity uh, in their region uh, because of their nuclear weapons. That worries me uh, a lot. Israel has nuclear weapons not acknowledged, but they obviously have them. I think there it's been justified by the fact that Israel's been uh, threatened by uh, historically by its neighbors and it introduced uh, a degree of caution into the Arab countries around it, understanding that there were limits to what they could do, again, without then risking uh, ruinous consequences for themselves. I think the next great test in the world uh, will probably be Iran. Uh, and the question is, can we succeed and making it impossible 
for Iran to reach nuclear status. And I think the worrisome thing about Iran and then North Korea is in, if Iran were to get nuclear weapons, it's not simply the aggression it might lead to on the part of Iran. It would give them a sense of impunity. But also, I think many other countries in the region would follow suit. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, and so forth. And if you think the Middle East is bad now, imagine that one. And if North Korea's nuclear arsenal begins to grow and so forth, uh, I worry about what that might mean for that part of the world. Uh, I think it's, it's very hard to contain it. So just because, coming back to your question, just because nuclear weapons may have served, or I believe did serve st or promote stability during the Cold War, to recreate those conditions, uh, I don't see it happening. It's, all, it's the reason that I see proliferation for the most part as a, as a threat. Let me turn to some of our audience questions now, and I'm going to start with one that uh, hits on kind of another uh, superpower in the world, because that was one of the things, too, in the, in the Cold War. You had basically the United States and Russia, and, and now you have, I think at least, you have a little bit more uh, world players involved here. And so um, this question goes to the, the rivalry now between China and the U.S., and the specific question revolves around um, what are China and the U.S. both doing to recruit allies to, to kind of stand with them? Um, and what um, may they be both be doing wrong in recruiting those allies or might not be doing a good job of recruiting those allies? Interesting question. Well, the United States begins with a great advantage, which is the United States has many allies. Uh, we have a close alliance with Japan, which is the world's third largest economy, has a very powerful military with South Korea, with Australia. Uh, we have very close relations with countries like uh, India, we have working pretty good relations with Vietnam. So the United States has many partners that are concerned about uh, China. So we, we've got that. And then we obviously have our, our allies in, in, in Europe. Uh, so we have, we have those events. China, for the most part, doesn't have allies, but it does have relationships. And for example, some of the countries I mentioned, which are our allies, have extensive economic ties with China. So South Korea, where we have 28,000 plus U.S. soldiers stationed, is one of our close allies. Its biggest economic partner is China. Uh, and, you know, I, and countries like Japan have extensive economic ties. Europe just signed a... Uh, an investment agreement with China, though it hasn't been implemented. Uh, and there's, pro there, you know, I think some Europeans are having second thoughts. I think, uh, again, I th we all things being equal, we have a structural advantage. We've hurt ourselves by not entering or participating into economic arrangements with many of our allies. There are regional economic groupings that have formed in, a, in the Asia Pacific that the United States has not joined. Uh, which is, I believe, a, a self-inflicted uh, wound, a kind of own goal. And unfortunately, uh, this is true across administrations, Democratic and, and uh, Republican, is, Republican. Bipartisanship isn't always a blessing, uh, as, we, as we, uh, we're, we're, we're seeing uh, here. Uh, I think we cannot ask countries to choose. So you've got to be 100% with us or, 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 or consider you against us. Uh, I don't think we can totally economically isolate China. China is too integrated in the world economically, unlike the Soviet Union. China is everywhere economically, uh, but we can perhaps restrict the flow of certain technologies going there. But we've also got to compete better. And here we can, again, we can work with our allies. If we don't want people using Chinese 5G, it'd be really good if we had an alternative to offer. And that's the sort of thing we could develop with, with allies and partners or, or 6G down the... Uh, Road. So uh, I think we have uh, the United States, indeed, it's, it's always the great structural advantage of our foreign policy is that we get up every morning and we have dozens of countries in the world that look to us and want to port partner with us. In many cases are formally uh, allied with us. And China doesn't have that. What China, again, has is a very active economic policy. A lot of countries are becoming somewhat beholden to it through loans and the uh, and the uh like and China is, you know, it's 1.4 billion people. It's it's got an enormous presence, and for a lot of countries near it, it it's hard to stand up to. Uh, 
which again, it's why it's so important for the United States, I believe, to, to be present and active in the world. If I could just follow up on that and, and maybe zero in, I know you talk about the Belt and Road Development Initiative in the book, and, and can you just explain a little bit about that and how that might fit into China's long-term sure. economic and, and you know, world policy? Yeah, this is one of the, the cardinal or signature policies of Xi Jinping, the leader of China. And it's essentially a large infrastructure initiative, infrastructure broadly defined. It's everything from roads, but also broadband, ports, almost anything you can imagine. In many ways, it began uh, for economic reasons as well as strategic reasons. China had done a tremendous amount of infrastructure development at home. At home. It had all this surplus capacity with no place to go. So it essentially decided it would export it to the rest of the world. And it's doing that. So it's good for Chinese uh, you know, employment. And, but, uh, and, and, and it's allowed China to develop all sorts of uh, relationships with countries. In many cases, they enter into debt and then they become somewhat beholden to China. And in several cases, are offering them certain types of access, say, to uh, ports uh, or, get, or giving China advantage positions in terms of access to certain materials. I believe uh, we've got to compete with it. And we can compete with it all sorts of ways through trade, through investment, through aid. And many uh, vaccines right now are a great way to compete with it. If we want to challenge or compete with China around the world, we should be producing and exporting far more vaccine against COVID-19 than we are. And we ought to think about encouraging certain firms to build factories around the world. There's the question of whether they ought to be encouraged to license certain technologies. But we, we've got to be on the field competing. Right now, the single biggest concern in most of the world is dealing with COVID-19. And we have largely been missing in action. And I, I just believe that's a, a, a massive mistake. Mm -hmm. I said one other thing. It's also a massive mistake for us. Not simply a foreign policy mistake. If we are worried about the emergence of variations, of mutations of this virus, which would then go into circulation, circulation and come back to the United States and... Um, eventually lead to loss of life here. The best way to deal with that is to help the rest of the world get vaccinated sooner rather than later. Well, this, this next question we have is a huge question, but of course uh, you, you did write the world of brief introductions. I'm sure you're going <laughs> to answer it. Uh, what do you see as the ultimate resolution to the problems in the Middle East? And, and I know that that's, you know, something right now that's on a lot of people's minds. And so um, you just get it's actually, it's that. a huge question, Matt, but it's my answer won't probably satisfy the person who answered. And I don't see a resolution hmm. anytime soon. So let me let me give people a slight framing there. Uh, we Americans use the word problem a lot. And the word problem su suggests solution. I would actually argue that lots of things in the world are not problems, but are situations or conditions. And situations or conditions, if you're good, you manage them. You, you prevent them reaching a point of crisis. So in, uh, in the world right now with COVID, I think that's a problem. That could ultimately be pretty much solved through a combination of vaccines, therapeutic drugs, social distancing, masking, better testing. We, we have a toolkit there. And I would argue that the challenge with this virus is to deploy at scale the, that toolkit. Uh, something like the Middle East is, is to me much more of a condition or situation. And the challenge, uh, so I don't see solutions. I don't, I don't use that word a lot. Now, could I imagine them? Sure. I can imagine, quote unquote, a solution to the Israel-Palestinian issue. The problem is I don't see any of the preconditions in place that would bring it about. Uh, it was interesting today, the president used the word opportunity and I was asked on television about it. And I said, well, I wish I agreed, but I don't. I don't see great opportunity. Could you have opportunity? Sure, you could have leaders who emerge, who are willing and able to make compromises and so forth. And, lead their respective political entities to that point. We saw it with Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin in the Middle East. We saw it with Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk in, in, in South Africa. 
uh, and you need people uh, on the various sides who are willing and able to do that. Uh, but that's rare. And so my, for the foreseeable future, given the, the, the divisions in the leadership in both Israel and in the Palestinian side, given the, uh, the, dif the difficulty of some of the issues, I don't see a uh, solution in the cards. I would think uh, an ambitious enough diplomacy would be to hold the ceasefire and to try to pursue policies that at least kept open the possibility of maybe one day there being a solution or progress towards that one, if and when such leadership that was willing and able to make difficult choices emerged on, on, on the part of the various uh, uh, parties. But uh, anytime soon, and say the Israeli-Palestinian issue, uh, I, I'm sorry to say, I don't, I don't see uh, solutions. I also, in many other cases, uh, I'm not sure I see solutions to such things as Iran's ambitions and capabilities in the regions, what's going on in Syria, what's going on in Yemen, what's going on in Lebanon, what's going, um, I could go around the Libya, uh, in many of these situations, I think the most you can probably do is, again, a, a degree of management rather than somehow bring about uh, whatever your notion is of a successful, normal, peaceful uh, country that's at peace with its own people and its neighbors. I just don't see that uh, in the cards. Sorry, but I'm sorry to be so, you know, what well, some would see pessimistic or negative, but I think I think we get in trouble when we, mis we, we mistake or we confuse problems with situations. And sometimes you've got to scale your diplomacy uh, to deal with what there is uh, rather than what it is you'd like there to be. I think that's a very realistic answer. And, and I'd, that, that's something I will use, not just in foreign policy, policy discussions, but that distinction you made there between um, problems and, and situations. Um, so our next question actually takes us out of this world. Uh, I, I don't believe that you address this in the book, but uh, this is kind of, to me, it's an interesting question. Uh, can you address the impact of future exploration of space um, uh, by multiple powers on the world order in the U.S.? And I think the person is, is thinking not only of possible colonization, but maybe weapon development, uh, further weapon development um, in outer space. Colonization, I think, is a long way off, though there could be potentially access, I suppose, to minerals or whatever. I'm much more worried for the next couple of decades about weaponization. I mean, think about how important space is right now, uh, just beginning with satellites, uh, communications, GPS, uh, and so forth. Uh, but so much of what we do is routed through satellites. Our militaries de uh, depend on them. Our financial systems in many ways do, communications do. And I worry that space is uh, very poorly regulated, that it's, it's, it's under-regulated. It's not as under-regulated as cyberspace, which is even more, more like the Wild West. But space is potentially a dangerous place because what would happen, I believe, early on in a conflict there would be uh, efforts, say, if it were between the United States and China, say, over Taiwan, there could very well be efforts to blind them, uh, one side or another. And the Chinese might try to interfere with uh, satellites and so forth, on which a lot of our military depends. So space becomes an important domain or dimension. And the fact that we now have a space command or space force, I think, is reflective of that. That just like we would think about the oceans or the airspace or the land, uh, increasingly, our weapon systems depend upon uh, the ability to, to use space. And that means being able to use, but also defend our ability to use it, to protect our, our system. So it's got tremendous commercial import. It also has tremendous uh, military import. And I worry because I think that potentially offense will be ahead of defense. Well, and, and picking up here, actually, on, on you just mentioned uh, cyber warfare. Um, we have a, a question here about uh, technological warfare and uh, cyber attacks. And so how much do you see that figuring into uh, maybe world disorder, if you will, in the future? I think we have to be really careful again with our terminology. 
and distinguish between cyber espionage and cyber attacks. Cyber espionage is a form of opening other people's mail. What's different is the nature of the mail. But when China, for example, gains access to personnel records, including mine in the Office of Personnel Management, that's a form of espionage. When Russia recently had got access to all aspects, you know, many aspects of our government and society, that's espionage. Shame on us for not better protecting ourselves. And we ought to be doing the same against them. Uh, attacks is something different. That's a form of aggression. And to me, you know, a, a cyber, think about it, a cyber weapon that disables a dam could be a weapon of mass destruction if it leads to massive floods. So cyber to me is a tool that can be weaponized. And we have, a, we, so there we need, and again, what worries me is international relations is lagging behind the technology. So when it comes to spying and the like, again, we've got to make it difficult for people to spy, to succeed. When it comes to people interfering in our political processes, we've got to think about how we make it more difficult for them to do that, whether it's through potentially regulating uh, social media, better protecting certain systems, uh, sanctioning them when they do it and so forth. But what worries me is about the weaponization of cyberspace, just like outer space. And there again, there's a there's almost no political uh, architecture for dealing with it. It is the Wild West. A lot of people with guns and no sheriff. And it's one of the areas where diplomacy needs to accelerate because we've got a tremendous gap there. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous, uh, it, that, that to me is a dangerous domain. We're going to go to a question here from a, a fellow educator um, and uh, almost go back, I think, to the beginning of our conversation when you were talking about why you wrote the book. Uh, but can you describe what you believe the U.S. roles should be in the world and how do we best leverage our schools to prepare youth for that role? It's a big question. Uh, look, I believe the U.S. role in the world begins with a recognition that where we began our conversation, that one, the world matters, both for better and for worse, and that what the United States chooses to do and not to do and how we do it also affects the world. It's almost a loop going in both directions. Uh, and so that to me is the beginning of awareness. What I would want schools and education to do is to help people understand the relationship between our country and the world in both directions. Look at some of the lessons to be learned from history. Again, uh, I want citizens to be informed. I want them to be able to ask questions of candidates. I want them to be able to hold those with power to account. I want them to make their own informed judgments in their lives and their businesses, uh, whether to, if they go work at this or that company uh, or, or, or what they should be participating in politically or not. So I would want schools to essentially uh, arm people to in, this, in the intellectual and the educational sense so they could make better choices, whether it's in their, their personal lives, their, their professional lives, their, their political lives. But, uh, and what I want to, I want, uh, and again, my motive is, I, uh, maybe I'm naive here, but I believe that if uh, schools do a better job of that, it will tend to make Americans understand that the world matters, which discourages isolationism, and will lead to a more uh, informed debate and a more uh, focused debate about what it is we do in, in, in the world, uh, using any and all of our instruments. Because we, we have these fundamental recurring debates. What sh how much foreign policy should we have? What should be our purposes in the world? Uh, what tools should we use and so forth? Well, these are, these are big questions. And I want people to essentially be able to participate in these debates, whether this is their career, but also I'd, I would hope that a lot of people would choose this for their careers, whether they join the military, the foreign service, the intelligence community, they're in an international business, they're uh, an academic, they're a journalist, they work at a, a think tank, there's a go work for not some NGO. There's so many ways to, to be a part 
of what's going on in the world and to, 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 to make a difference. So again, I would want schools to uh, make people be more discerning and help them make, uh, make these choices. So we have a couple of questions here that um, I'm, I'm trying to summarize them. They basically um, are seeing globalism as, uh, again, another ism here. Um, and, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, nationalism and, and, and uh, some of the issues surrounding that. Um, but they're also asking about issues that you see with globalization, with globalism. Um, what, what are some ways that we might be able to mitigate the negative sure. impacts of, of globalism? Well, first of all, I don't know what globalism means. I'm always attacked for being a globalist and I never know what that means. The way I would put it is globalization is a reality. And by that, I mean, borders don't always count for a lot. A lot of what happens anywhere doesn't stay there. My favorite line is the world is not Las Vegas. What happens there doesn't stay there. So a virus that broke out in a Chinese city called Wuhan of what, 11 million people has now claimed, I don't know, 10 million or more dead around the world, if one looks at the real numbers. Climate change, which is the cumulative result of economic activity around the world is affecting water supply. It's causing migration. It's causing fires. It's having effects on animal life, insect life, uh, agriculture, uh, you name it. So th these are all forms of globalization. Now, how we react to them, that's policy. Hmm. So how we react to climate change, what it is we do in terms of energy policy, regulatory policy, diplomacy, that's a subject for debate. And people can and will and should have different uh, ideas about what should be done. How do we react to infectious disease? Uh, the debates about social distancing or masking, what we talked about before about vaccine production and availability, uh, testing, uh, and so forth. Those are questions about how to react. How do we, re you asked me before about nuclear weapons, how we react to proliferation. Okay, that's a policy uh, debate. How do we react to terrorism? That's a legitimate policy debate. How do we react to immigration? So all these are phenomena. So globalization is simply the reality that, again, there's all these things that cross borders, tremendous volume, tremendous speed. And the, in most instances, the only thing you can then do is have a serious debate about what aspects of globalization you promote, what aspects you resist, what, access, what aspects you, you, try to, uh, you try to regulate. And I think that's a useful way to think about it. But railing on against globalization doesn't make much sense to make because, again, it's reality, like it or not. And also, just to be clear, there's a fundamental difference, and they're often confused, between what's called global governance, A-N-C-E, and global government, M-E-N-T. Uh, the former, global governance, is basically what kind of arrangements do we cobble together to deal with some of these challenges and to deal with climate change or proliferation or to regulate the the you know, the use of space for military purposes. Those are legitimate diplomatic questions. What role do we assign to the World Health Organization or do we build some new organization? Though that's all forms of global governance. And that's a serious conversation. No one who is serious is talking about global government as some type of a single entity that threatens the sovereignty or independence of the United States. The only serious question is what is it we do ourselves and what is it we do with others? Because in many instances, working with others is a, a better trajectory for the United States as a way of taking care of ourselves. I think we, we are getting close to our time here, but I think we have probably time for, for two more uh, questions here. So one, again, I want to summarize uh, some of the audience questions. A number of people are asking about uh, the future of democracy. And I just wanted to throw out, I actually noted this statistic from your book that 40% of the world's population live in democracies, 30% in unde undemocratic societies, and around 30% in countries that are somewhere in between. So, you know, with, with those kind of numbers, I mean, what do you see? Is, is the world becoming more democratic or less democratic? The statistics show that over the last roughly decade and a half, the world has become less democratic. 
Uh, the, 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 the word of art is backsliding, that we're seeing democracies become less democratic. You asked me before about populism. It's much more pronounced. Technology is hurting in terms of uh, social media. It's been a real problem for democracies. Uh, social media also or new technologies in places like China have been used to give the central government much more control and access to information, much more control over the uh, population. We, we had the, uh, you know, recently the coup in uh, Myanmar. But look at our own country. Look at, look at January 6th. Uh, democracy is having trouble performing in, in, in this country. The debates we're having about uh, basic rights, including uh, voting rights, how we're dealing with discrimination. Uh, and one of the problems in the world with democracy is the United States, uh, which uh, for a long time was the great exemplar to use Ronald Reagan's and John Kennedy's phrase, uh, you know, the shining city on a hill. Uh, we're not looking so shiny these days. Uh, there's very few people around the world, I think, when they get up in the morning now and they look at American democracy, they say they want to be more like us. Indeed, it's, it's, it, it, and it, it makes me incredibly frustrated when I see things, say, on Chinese television where they show scenes of American uh, quote unquote democracy, including things like January 6th on Capitol Hill. And they use that to justify repression and authoritarianism. And they say, see, democracy is anarchic. We can better look after you, the Chinese people, if you accept a different relationship with your, with your government. So again, uh, what's happening here, again, it's like globalization. It doesn't just stay here. It affects the rest of the world. And that's one of the reasons also, I believe, we're seeing backsliding. All right. My final question, Dr. Haas, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Kelsey to close this out. But, um, you know, this, um, this book that, that you wrote is very informative. Um, but even at the end of it, you also say, and continuing with this theme of education, that uh, you, you want to provide other resources to people. So just in the minute we have left, do you have recommendations for, after they read your book, of course, um, other sure. choices they can go? Look, I think every person ought to make a commitment to read one newspaper that covers the world well. New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Financial Times. There are some others. There's some, the Economist is a very good weekly uh, read. We, we publish the Council on Foreign Relations, Foreign Affairs Magazine, which is the, the best journal in the field. I'd like to think our website, CFR.org, is a really helpful, probably best one-stop shopping to teach people uh, about the, the basics of the world. But these are all serious places to go that don't have agendas. And I would just be very wary of, uh, we live in a world of narrow casting. be very wary of those websites and those cable stations and those radio stations that have uh, truly politicized agendas because they will either be inaccurate in what, they re in what they give you, or they won't be comprehensive. Um, they, they won't give you a, a full picture. And as a result, uh, it can be really uh, misleading. One last thing, I, when I used to go to a gym, Matt, back uh, before COVID, uh, and I'd spend about a half an hour on the uh, elliptical, the rule I had was 10, 10, 10. I'd spend 10 minutes each on different TV stations mm -hmm. just to get a sense of what Others are saying, so get outside of your comfort zone. Whether you're liberal, then tune into Fox for a few minutes. Or if you're normally on Fox, tune into MSNBC or CNN. Expose yourself a bit, I think, to, to the other side. Just uh, to get outside of your comfort zone. Get outside of your own uh, echo chamber. I think it's healthy. That's great advice. Well, thank you, Dr. Haas. Truly appreciated the conversation. And, and i turn it over to Kelsey now. Thank you so much to both both of you, Dr. Akers and Dr. Haas, for this fantastic discussion this evening. And Dr. Haas, I think you closed it on some really great advice that we have to listen to all sides. We have to stay out, of, you know, branch out of our own little bubbles. Um, if for anyone who's interested, please remember Dr. Haas's book is available for purchase courtesy of the Learned Out, or you can even pick it up from our local library here at the Hudson Library. Um, thank you both so much for your time this evening. It was a pleasure to meet both of you and to have this conversation. Thank you. Stay healthy, everybody. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.